joining us this morning for a visionary plant walk. My name is Jesse, the Director of Marketing and Communications at Greenbelt Alliance. And for those of you who aren't familiar with our work, our mission is to educate, advocate, and collaborate to ensure the Bay Area's lands and communities are resilient to a changing climate. The work we do to protect the Bay Area's natural and agricultural lands while also creating thriving communities, as well as this free outings program is made possible by you. So please donate today, which you can do so securely on our website at greenbelt.org forward slash donate. During the outing, please feel free to ask questions via the chat or Q&A function, um, and we will answer them at the end. We'll also be sending a follow-up email to everyone who has registered, which will include a link to the recording of this event, as well as links to other resources. And with that, I'll hand it over to Ken, our wonderful outings leader, to get us started. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us today and thought I'd just let you know about a couple of more virtual outings we have on the schedule. On April 10th, Bob Johnson, one of our Greenbelt Alliance board members will lead us through Las Trampas Regional Wilderness and talk about the plants and uh, the uh, plant communities and, and, and the wildflowers that are in bloom. And then on April 24th, also a Saturday morning, we'll talk a little bit about redwood ecology and how it's affected by climate change and some uh, little known tidbits about Muir Woods and its history, including the 43 foot tall statue of Buddha at one time stood in Bohemian Grove. So that's coming up. But today we have a, a great program. Our presenter is Alan Siegel and Alan has hiked the East Bay Hills almost daily since the early 1970s, trying to learn every plant and its edible, medicinal and cultural uses and to discover and use native plants that thrive in gardens that are frequently visited by deer. Alan is a volunteer docent at the Regional Parks Botanic Garden in Tilden Park, where he enjoys meals of stinging nettle washed down with yerba buena tea. As a psychologist, Alan is interested in how cultures discover the uses of plants and enjoys sharing stories of how diverse peoples use plants in unique ways. Alan has led native plant and nature awareness education walks for adults and children for 45 years. So with that, I'll hand it over to Alan. Thank you, Ken and Jesse. And uh, welcome to everybody. I'm gonna move to the first slide here. Um, and this is just a, a title slide. It's uh, so populating here, uh, visionary plant walking. And hopefully this will give you uh, a chance to see the beautiful visions and also to have new insights into your own life into our and to, into our connection with nature. Uh, happy Vernal Equinox. What a, what a great day to do this kind of a thing. The fr very first day of spring. Uh, and uh, this is a view at the top of the trail we're going to virtually hike on today. And this is taken one year ago, but I was there yesterday and this is exactly how it looks now. All the poppies and lupin are in bloom, the views, in this case, out to Mount Diablo in the east, and uh, just a gorgeous place to, to visit. And um, at the top, there's a labyrinth, and this is a funky homemade labyrinth that gets made and unmade over the years. And here's a, a classic uh, picture of a labyrinth. And this is a, a hiking group that I've been in for over 20 years. And here we are, masked and at social distance. From this site, you can see the Sierra on a clear day, you can see the Farallons, you can see um, Mount St. Helena, uh, you can see Mount Tam, it's just an amazing view. And this is a sunset uh, view looking to the west from the top from the labyrinth. So it's a very, it's a gorgeous trail and a lot of trails in the East Bay Regional Parks are as well. And before we get into the plants, um, here's, a, here's a few creatures you may encounter. Uh, a pipe vine swallowtail caterpillar. This is um, a plant, um, a caterpillar or butterfly that must have the Dutchman's pipe, which is a, it's actually um, feeding on the fruit of the Dutchman's pipe uh, vine and a California quail. And uh, here's a, a little motion in a ladybug picture. <laughs> okay, so we're mostly gonna focus on uh, plants, uh, but uh, okay, so these are, a few plants that I took these pictures in March. So it's just this month. And uh, these are things that are in bloom now. 
uh, checker bloom on the left, which is a wild hollyhock. Uh, th this is mule's ears. Uh, interesting how plants are named. Do these leaves look like mule's ears? Uh, I guess someone thought they were. This is buttercup, and this doesn't show the the buttery texture as well as as when you see it in person, but it, it does look like little pads of butter. And this is a close up on lupin. Uh, these are common plants you'll see right now in bloom. Here's some other ones that you may see a little bit less common: uh, columbine, trillium, uh, paintbrush, and uh, iris. So these are all uh, more beautiful plants to see. Uh, this is a great resource, uh, and it is the East Bay Regional Park puts out a photographic guide to the showy wildflowers of Feldman Regional Park. And it isn't just these, it's a color coordinated list. So the link for that is in here and it will be in the link that Jesse will send after this. And here's some other links. Again, this will all be sent to you. Uh, the Friends of the Regional Park Botanic Garden where the hike starts, uh, the California Native Plant Society, Bay Nature, and iNaturalist, which is a great app for learning about plants. You can actually, with your smartphone, identify a plant when you're out in the field uh, and, and some other uh, places to buy natives that you can grow. OK, so a walk in the woods. So hiking in our parks can be an antidote to isolation during the quarantine and may help us connect with the cycles and seasons of nature and perhaps discover a renewed motivation to advocate for the preservation of our precious flora and open spaces and green belts. And so I'm gonna start with a little poetic inspiration from a uh, favorite poet, Gary Snyder and his Pulitzer Prize volume of poems for the children. He wrote, in the next century or the one beyond that they say, our valleys, pastures. We can meet there in peace if we make it. To climb these coming crests, one word to you, to you and your children, stay together, learn the flowers, go light. So some, what, what we learn, uh, teach, teach to our friends, teach to our children, because we have to preserve our nature. And part of that is by learning, learning about some of the aspects of it, not just the plants, although that's what we'll focus on today. Here's a trail map. You can Google this anytime. Uh, go to the Regional Parks uh, website. I, I've um, focused this in a little bit. You can see the parts in red or the, the two of the um, places, the Botanic Garden here in the lower part and the steam train. Uh, but again, the, so those are two of the access points of the trail we're going to go on, but you can easily access this yourself. And here's just some of the links. Uh, again, these will be sent to you. Uh, this is a very cool trail because you can access it from three different directions and there's numerous circle routes. So most of the time you, I access it and you can from the Tilden Botanic Garden, which is at the bottom. It's, it's on Wildcat Drive and it's at the bottom of South Park Drive. Uh, and from these um, access points, you can access Big Springs and Arroyo Trail, or if you want a slightly less steep uh, trail on a paved trail, the upper steam train line gives a direct access to see view on a paved trail until you get to the top. And anybody who's had kids or grandkids has probably either gone to or thought about going to the steam trains and had, has memories of that. So here's going up South Park Drive. South Park Drive is actually, the gate is locked six months of the year on this road, South Park Drive to protect the newts that cross the street and other places uh, during, during the rainy months. It's actually been closed for 18 months because it was kept closed during the quarantine. You can see the eucalyptus trees that have been cut back. This is the entrance Big Springs Trail, which is maybe about a third of a mile up from the Botanic Garden. And as you climb up, you can see the old quarry and the eucalyptus trees that have been cut back. And just maybe a couple hundred yards up the uh, South Park Drive is the trailhead where this cairn is for Arroyo Trail. Arroyo is a gully and it's formed by the Big Spring, a creek that has formed the gulch here. And here's um, a view going up um, Arroyo. And uh, here's the entrance from the steam train uh, to the trail that gets you to Sea View Trail. And this is the sign on Grizzly Peak Boulevard. And this is as you turn in and it's the lower parking lot where you would normally use the steam trains, which have been closed, is, is often locked. So you go, there's an upper parking lot. And this is, we'll see another picture of this. This is the mysterious stone wall that's above Sea View Trail with a view of Mount Diablo in the background. And uh, here's Mugwort and Mount Diablo, a plant we'll be talking about. Uh, you, can, you can see the mountain in the back and here's a little, another picture of the stone wall. And here's uh, our golden doodle, Stella grazing in a meadow above Seaview Trail. 
Uh, this is a meadow that my hiking group, uh, we, we've nicknamed the Baby Blue Eyes Meadow because it's a really beautiful uh, spring flower, which is blooming now. Uh, so here's some views from the top of uh, Seaview. You can see the, um, the Briones and the San Pablo Reservoirs. You can see hiking along uh, the trail. And there's actually a trail above Seaview along the spine of the ridge where sometimes you'll see slightly better views and slightly more wildflowers. It's a little bit um, more precarious. So here's again, the labyrinth with my hiking group, the view to the, to the west. Um, and uh, here we go. Okay, here's a little bit more of the mystery wall. Uh, it, I had originally heard it was the boundary of a large ranch. Um, apparently that may or may not be true. So you can, you can think of your own uh, uses for it, but it is a part of a wall that remains there above the Seaview Trail. And again, we can see Mount Diablo looking to the east from around the same area. Uh, here's the baby blue eyes and the baby blue eyes meadow. And you can see the, the views off here and, and, and part of the trail. And uh, so uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about what ethnobotany is briefly, and then we're gonna learn a little bit more. So some, it, basically we're gonna look at how the indigenous people in the Bay Area and California use plants for food, medicine, and fishing, but also different um, cultures all over the world. And so this is everything from basket weaving to medicine and food. And uh, uh, some of these plants have a history across cultures that dates back millennia, especially the plant mugwort, which we'll talk about. So here's, let's start with some incredible edibles, both natives and introduced weeds. A couple of these aren't natives, uh, but miner's lettuce is. Chickweed is uh, delicious. It will invade your garden. Uh, sheep sorrel, I don't think it's a native, or cardamine, which is a very invasive but delicious member of the mustard family. So here's some green. So this is, many people know miner's lettuce. The, the genus and species is Claytona, Claytonia perfoliata. So salad days are here. This is the different forms that the uh, miner's lettuce takes. It starts out, it looks like blades of grass and with uh, this sort of arrow shaped triangular uh, shapes forming. Then um, right around Valentine's day, uh, this could be a gift for your sweetheart, a heart shaped uh, miner's lettuce leaf. And here is the more mature miner's lettuce leaf. The flowers actually come out from inside the leaf, which is why it's called perfoliate. That's the term for that. Uh, so here's some, uh, this is miner's lettuce. I planted some seeds in my garden and it definitely spreads out. Uh, it's a little bit invasive, but it dries up within a few weeks. So you can harvest all the miner's lettuce you need in your garden and it'll come up the next year without, without um, causing any uh, invasion to other plants. This is another plant that is not a native, but it is a delicious to eat. Uh, ten petal um, chickweed, Stellaria, which um, represents the Latin name for the star shape of the flower, more or less. Uh, and also, uh, I don't have a good picture here, but one of the ways to identify this is there's one thin line of hairs that goes up the stem. So if you hold it up and if you have your reading glasses on, you can see that one line of hair. So this is a delicious, but don't let it get too active in your garden. It'll, it'll spread out. Here's some other ones, sheep sorrel, which is related to dock. It's related to French sorrel. So it has a lemony taste. It's, it's a very good uh, extra thing to spice up your salad. And this is cardamine. Uh, which is a type of mustard. Uh, it's in the mustard family anyway. Uh, don't let this get too active in your garden. It will really spread out. And you'll see it um, as, as an invasive weed, but it's actually quite delicious. Uh, the cardamine actually pops out its seeds. You, it, it, so, you, you know, you can use all your senses for uh, a plant walk. And sometimes you'll even hear the seeds being popped out of a plant. Yerba buena is our next plant, um, the good herb in Spanish. Uh, so it also is synonymous with mint in some, in some um, Latinx and Spanish speaking cultures. And you can make tea out of this. It's very delicious. And um, it was the original name for San Francisco because it was highly prevalent. Uh, and here we've got um, some of the, the pictures on the right are some of the residues of the name. We've got the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. We've got Yerba Buena Island. Uh, and what are some of the medicinal uses? Uh, so it, it reportedly soothes digestion, eliminates bad breath, aids in weight loss, reduces menstrual discomfort, and protects the immune system. It needs a shady spot to grow. Uh, do your own research before using it in any way and, and make sure you know what it looks like. Uh, so here's a few guidelines uh, for plant walking. Use all of your senses. As I said, even sound sometimes, but the smell, the color, the feel, the taste, and even the sound. 
never eat a plant that you have not definitively identified. You can't pick from public lands. Take only pictures and leave no trace or sketches if you're artistic. Uh, I suggest using or learning about the iNaturalist app or Seek, which is a, a water, uh, not a watered down, but a simpler version of iNaturalist using the same database. The Botanic Gardens, there's two in Berkeley, the, the, the Tilden Botanic Garden where I'm a volunteer docent and the UC Bot uh, Botanic Garden. Uh, so all of these Botanic Gardens, including one in San Francisco have labeled plants, making it easy to learn and public education programs and docent trainings. Learn all the poisonous plants, which is what we're gonna do next briefly. And although we can't always pick plants, the medicinal, the nourishment and medicinal virtues of the plants come from the experience of being in nature and getting to know the plants and inspiration to protect our native species and our green belts. So here's some of the common poisonous plants, the ones you must know if, if you're gonna um, learn to harvest anything. A poison oak, uh, even without leaves, it can be very, very harmful. It uh, causes horrible itching for a week or two and has many uses to those who are not allergic, which we'll mention in a moment. Poison hemlock looks like wild parrot. It was common and invasive all over the place. It'll, it'll invade and it was the demise of Socrates. Nightshade we'll mention briefly and stinging nettles we'll mention more in, in depth momentarily. Um, so poison oak, this shows the different forms of it. Looking to the, on the right, these are the brand new leaves coming out, uh, totally red. Of course, before the leaves come out, right in the spring, and when the leaves first come out, it's the deadly, deadly is too strong of a word, but it's the most harmful. The juices and the oils are more active. But you can see the green in the middle um, photo starting to appear. And this is the leaves early in the spring, but they, they've matured into the state they'll be in until the fall. And the name of the, this plant is toxic androgen globum. Don't try to say that 10 times fast, but it means that this is a plant with um, toxic stems, toxicodendron, and diverse leaves or lobes. So you can see that the, sometimes the leaves are mitten-like and sometimes they're entire with no indentation. So that can be deceptive and that's something to know in terms of identification. Um, one interesting story is that the um, native California's um, First, First Nations um, indigenous people were generally not allergic and it was used for skin diseases and for tattooing. Um, this on the right here, you can see the indigo black dye that exudes. Anytime you cut a poison oak branch, you'll see that this indigo ink, uh, black ink, uh, ooze out slowly. And this is the plant again in the fall. The leaves turn red. And this is probably our best example, um, perhaps with um, big leaf maple, but of fall color. So you'll see this all over the place. Uh, and the indigo oil. Uh, was used for tattooing uh, the, the needle of the hemlock tree, not the hemlock herb, was used to puncture the skin and the dye from the poison oak was used uh, to make the tattoos. And for those who were not allergic, poison oak is good for skin diseases such as eczema and, and other skin diseases. So uh, paradoxically, um, very useful medicinally uh, in a way that you wouldn't expect. Um, some people say they're not allergic to poison oak, but be cautious. You can become allergic later in life to things you're not allergic to. And it is a hazard when you're hiking because sometimes it's the leaves stick out particularly, or the branches stick out uh, in the late fall and early winter. Poison hemlock, uh, Conium maculatum is the genus and species. Uh, conium from the Greek, which means to fall down or reel about and maculatum, which means the splotched wine-colored stains on the stems. Looks just like a carrot, looks just like Queen Anne's lace if you're from the East Coast, a very common uh, weed. And this is a real pest in gardens. It grows both in the, in the wilds and in people's lawns. And uh, be careful even when you're cutting it, if you're weed whipping it, because the dust could actually have a somewhat neurotoxic effect. And of course, hemlock, uh, was that's how Socrates was um, executed. And uh, here's Socrates drinking the hemlock, uh, a little uh, slight, slight uh, you can't really uh, turn that into a joke, but I just drank what? Um, so here's another uh, poisonous plant, which we won't spend too much time on, but 
Uh, it's called nightshade or deadly nightshade. There's many different species of this. It looks so much like a tomato plant and is in the same family. A lot of times the berries are black and they have some edible uses, but I would avoid them. Uh, they're mostly toxic and only used um, either nutritionally or medicinally if you know the exact species and the exact stage. Um, here's another plant which is not poisonous per se, and this is one where we're going to get into the stories a little bit. Um, and so this is stinging nettles, a delicious vegetable, five and a half percent protein. Uh, it's mild tasting. Uh, the upscale um, restaurants that serve uh, you know, expensive pizzas often put roasted uh, nettles on their pizza. Um, it's used in many ways medicinally. The, the actually, even though the every hair on the stem stings, the fibers were used for cord and rope. Uh, of course, you have to dry it and then the sting is no longer there. So let's look more closely at the hairs that sting you. This is the stem and you can really see the hairs on the close up. Uh, on both of these and even on the leaves, touching the leaves, you can, you can see the hairs there. Each of these hairs sting with formic acid. It, don't try this uh, without gloves. Uh, the sting is similar to fire ants and it lasts um, one or two days. It is a powerful sting, like getting stung by a bee, but not the same as a bee sting. And these are an example. These are not fire ants, but these were actually on San Bruno Mountain and these are, uh, I got this, it's um, Formica integroides. So it's a type, I believe, related to fire ants. So that's the kind of sting you'll get. So, but with one minute of preparation, one minute of boiling uh, or with drying for use in cord, it can be used you know, verbally and, and nutritionally. Now, one of the interesting stories here um, is that the plant's genus is Urtica. And there is a term called which means to flagellate with nettle branches. And this was used actually for skin diseases in, in some cases, but more often uh, native first people and indigenous people in the Northwest who went uh, hide, hunting and um, fishing in the cold winter weather would sting their bodies with nettles, which was called urtication, so that the blood would flow and they would be able to stay warm and survive in, in, the, in the harsh winter temperatures while they were fishing. So very interesting use. Um, so th there'll be resources on this at the end, but basically the, we have three botanic gardens in Berkeley and San Francisco. Many, many of, they all have native, they all have labeled plants. Um, I mentioned the use of iNaturalist. Uh, so these are, these can allow you to learn and identify plants just with your smartphone uh, out in the woods. So it's worth checking out. Uh, here's our next plant with many stories. Uh, and there's, there'll be um, a bunch of links about bay laurel and I'll show you some of the uses momentarily here. Here's the flowers uh, and here's the fruit which grows later in the, in the summer and fall, uh, fruit with leaves. And this, these leaves, are not the exact species that's used in bay leaves, but they can be used as a substitute. And occasionally you'll see them in, in spice racks. Uh, they're a little bit stronger, uh, but they can be used. And um, moving on to some more of the uses. So the name for this is Umbellularia, Umbellularia californica. Don't say that 10 times. It's endemic, which means it originally grows only in California, Oregon, and Baja. This is a good example of the many why um, the Latin and scientific names are important. This, these are the different names that the um, bay tree has. And locally, it's generally California Bay Laurel, Bay or Laurel. You know, county, uh, you'll see Pepperwood Motel, Pepperwood Restaurant, it's called a Pepperwood. In Oregon, it grows into Southern Oregon, it's called Oregon Myrtle or Myrtle. Uh, and the, the wood of the, um, the bay tree is used for carving salad bowls and salad utensils and other fine wooden products. And there is one bay is the main carrier of sudden oak death, which is killing many of California's precious oaks. And there'll be a link on that sent to you um, after this. And so there's a bunch of links on how to forage and prepare bay nuts, uh, particularly one from Bay Nature magazine, which I highly recommend. Uh, and uh, there's some other books here uh, and uh, okay. These are the fruits. This is a fruit 
that I found this on the ground that was cracked open. So you can see the fruit nut. And in, if you crack the nut, is the fruit of the nut or the meat of the nut. These are how th they will get brown and dry on the tree if left there, or they'll fall off. And this is how uh, I found these on the ground, and th this is how they'll look. And um, the, you can roast the bay nuts. So this is the bay nuts. Um, this is how they found on the ground. This is with the, um, the skin peeled off. Ride. This is the fruit of, or the meat of the nut, unroasted, the nut that's roasted. Now these nuts were not only, they were caffeinated. Uh, I haven't seen Pete's offering a roast bay nut macchiato with extra foam yet, but you can, you can use these uh, for a morning buzz. And uh, the, the, uh, the value of this was both the caffeination uh, for, for uh, native peoples and indigenous peoples who use them, but also was a way to store food that could last for a year and could be valuable at a time when th there was less food around or less access. So the bay has many uses you know, for food, for medicine. And uh, here's a little final thing here. Uh, it's a flea and tick repellent. So put them in your socks, put them in your belt. Here's uh, Stella, our golden doodle, modeling uh, bay leaves uh, in, in her collar. Um, this isn't the best way to wear them uh, unless you're trying to do an imitation of Pam. Uh, but you, but a good place to put them is in your socks or shoes because ticks often enter uh, from the feet as they jump onto you and crawl up, uh, particularly in the spring. Uh, so we're going to move now to mugwort, which is uh, one of the magical plants or herbs. Uh, and wart means anybody who's read Harry Potter know, knows it means herb. Uh, and mugwort and yarrow, which we're going to talk about, oh, are among their many uses are considered onirogens, meaning they induce dreams or stimulate dreaming. And mugwort has many medicinal uses and spiritual properties. It's linked to the goddess Artemis, and hence its botanic or uh, genus Artemisia. There is over 3,500 years of documented usage. Uh, it was mentioned and description of mugwort was found uh, in Egyptian tablets. Uh, it's been it's been mentioned in various historical um, usages uh, throughout time since then. It's easy to grow in your garden and to make dream pillows and used in acu acupuncture and beer brewing. We'll see some. So here's some images I pulled from the web. The goddess Artemis, also called Diana, the goddess of nature. So this was uh, this was an herb that was clo closely associated with the ruler of, of nature. Uh, and here's some of the things I mentioned. The, also, besides the Egyptian papyrus, which described the plant, Venus, the Roman goddess, is sometimes depicted with a sprig of mugwort. Pliny the Elder extolled the virtues of mugwort. And for anyone who's into um, beers, it's, that's, it's not the Pliny the Elder that has the uh, sought after beer. This was the original Pliny the Elder herbalist. And it was one of the nine magic herbs on Druid, of Druid and Anglo Saxon tribes. And many cultures associate the uh, mugwort with stimulating precognitive dreams. English herbal tomes uh, from the Middle Ages suggest that a dream pillow of mugwort would allow a person or their future spouse. Um, some other links are um, a very closely related member of the um, similar genus Artemisia is wormwood, which absinthe was derived from, which is um, having a renewed uh, uh, interest in, in that. It, oops, it was very, I'm going back, it was very popular with, um, in the late 1800s, Baudelaire, Edgar Allan Poe, Van Gogh used, I think Coleridge as well, used the, the absinthe uh, for poetic inspiration. Apparently copper salts were used, which were toxic. And so the uh, wormwood and absinthe now uh, is devoid of the uh, toxic elements, but still um, uses, that, uses that. And Interestingly, beer in the Middle Ages in, in the UK was brewed with mugwort, not with hops, hence the name mugwort, the, the herb of the brew. Um, and still the tradition continues in rural uh, Britain, a mugwort leaf in an ale, hearkening back to that tradition. And here's just some examples of uh, 
this is a great book, but uh, this is just one volume. Uh, an anthropologist, Daniel Mormon, put together uh, an ethnobotanical dictionary. And here's more of a new age kind of thing pulled off the internet on the nine sacred herbs, which includes mugwort. So it's very easy once you know even a few of these plants to quickly do the research. Um, here's mugwort in my garden. Um, it does spread out, so be careful. But if you want to make mugwort pillows for holiday gifts uh, or use them yourself, it's very, very easy to grow. The deer don't eat it. And uh, you can use it um, for, for uh, medicinal uses uh, and other things. And here's some of how a renewal of the use of mugwort for ale. Uh, here's some images of mugwort red ale, uh, make your own home brew, uh, an example. Uh, and here's a, a link uh, of how to make mugwort elderflower and ginger ale. It says this is the best beer we've ever had. I haven't had it, but I'll take their word. Uh, and finally, uh, mugwort is used in acupuncture in what's called moksha. Moksha, this um, on the right here, uh, is a cube or a stalk pressed with the fibers from the bottom of the mugwort leaves. You can see the bottom of the leaf here, see these white fibers. If you rub them off, you'll essentially have the ingredient of the mugwort cubes. Uh, and here's the leaves again. Uh, so I, I purchased these from Amazon. I'm, I'm not skilled in acupuncture. I've never had acupuncture, but I know a lot of people that have benefited from it. And it's the smoke from the acupuncture that, um, the smoke from the moksha that enhances the, the action of, of the acupuncture. Uh, sagebrush is, um, briefly, it's another very widespread herb. It's, you can see it in Tilden, you can see it in the Eastern Sierra, all over North, you know, at the, um, North American mountains. And it's a close relative of mugwort, often Artemisia tridentata or Californica, same genus as mugwort and widespread in East Bay and Eastern Sierra. So I'm gonna to move to yarrow, which is another magical and medicinal herb. Uh, here are some of the very finely divided leaves. Here are some of the flowers. The, uh, it, its name is uh, for Achilles uh, and the, it's Achillea, Milfolium, which is the, all the many, many flowers. Uh, and it's worldwide. There's medicinal and spiritual uses for yarrow, uh, for bleeding, for fevers, for pain relief, for purification, and in the I Ching or Yi Jing as it's pronounced. Um, Achilles used the, uh, used the yarrow for arrow wounds for his soldiers. So uh, yarrow for arrow wounds. Uh, these are uh, the beaching, and um, I have my, uh, well, these are, and my yarrow stalks uh, I got here, which were picked uh, 48 years ago on the Mendocino coast and are still, still useful. I, I was um, into the aging, uh, in, you know, quite a few years ago. Here's, you can pick your own yarrow stalks or, uh, and essentially why the yarrow was used is it was considered an oracle plant. It had um, divinatory properties. And so there's a way of casting, you throw out the yarrow stalks in a spontaneous groups, and that leads you to passages in the Yi Jing, which would foretell your future or um, things about your life. Uh, so this is something, here, here's, there, there's a link here, which I think is in the uh, references that'll be sent to you uh, about the yarrow stalks. Uh, on, you can see how to cast them on, on um, YouTube and. Uh, amazing, easy access to learn more about that. And if anybody who's had acupuncture, you may or may not have had um, the Masha, oh, I'm going back to mugwort, so sorry. Um, okay, so um, yarrow has many, many uses. Uh, uh, and uh, here's another um, medicinal and magical plant. Um, this is purple sage. And purple sage, um, perhaps, if anybody's, uh, any deadheads in the audience, uh, this is where the uh, new writers of the purple sage got their name. Uh, you can see the really uh, finely divided uh, texture of the leaves. Uh, the scent of the sage is, I, I find, very refreshing. Um, here's the seed pods. So um, this is similar if anybody's ever made a chia pet or had chia seeds as a nutritional supplement. This isn't chia, but it's somewhat similar the way the chia seed pods look. And if you found them when they were mature in the fall or winter, you could tap them slightly and you, you'd see the seeds come out. Uh, so this is a really great garden plant for uh, native gardening. 
it's drought resistant, it's deer resistant. Uh, it was also considered to be an herb, one of the herbs at, like mart and yarrow for spiritual cleansing. People burned the, the uh, stalks. Uh, this was even a plant that people broke into the botanic garden to steal it uh, for new age you know, usages or whatever. It's incredibly easy to grow. Uh, and uh, the botanic garden is, is so special. We, you know, it's really important not, not to break into it. But anyway, this is easy to grow. Uh, the tea is very strong and has um, soothing and calming effects. There's many medicinal uses. Um, so this is actually not native to Tilden Park but it's very common in Tilden Park. Uh, it's native to Southern California, but it was planted um, and, and in, perhaps in the early 40s and has spread all over Tilden. Uh, so many people think it's native and it, it's beautiful, it's good for tea and good to grow. So now let's look at plants that are used for fish poison and soap. Uh, and Cucumber and soap root lily are were used by indigenous peoples for, for fish poison. I'll explain that in a moment. Images of wild cucumber. Uh, the name is Mara Favaceus. Uh, it stuns fish. It doesn't poison them. Uh, and the fruit looked like a medieval mace. All of the parts of the plant are toxic to humans. Uh, but if you look at the, if the tendrils, if you look at the flower buds, and if you look at the flowers and the leaves, it looks just like a cucumber or a zucchini or many members of the squash family. And it's, a, it's closely related, but this is not something you're gonna to wanna to stir fry with tofu. This is all parts of the plant are toxic. And it was um, also, it was named uh, man root. That's probably gonna get canned into person root at some point. Uh, there was one there at the Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Garden, uh, one of the man roots or human roots were dug up, weighed 467 pounds. So they're giant roots. I actually have one uh, in, in my own garden uh, that was there when I moved in and it, it's incredibly prolific. You have to keep it you know, cut back. Uh, but basically the, uh, the fruit was crushed and was put into a dammed up stream and that would stun the gill action of the fish. Then they were to be dried or salted and kept uh, so that you could have food sources when there was less access, um, less fish. Uh, so this is a really interesting story. Um, and uh, it's pretty unexpected because the, the plant is toxic. And imagine when you see this plant, which is very easy to see right now, you'll see both the flowers and eventually you'll see the fruits. Uh, imagine that there's a giant root underneath um, in the shape of a human being. Uh, here's another plant that has many, many uses, one of which is as a fish poison, but there's many other uses, as you might imagine. One of them is soap. Uh, and here's some images. These, this is soap root in my garden. This one has spread out. Uh, they, they will uh, begin to spread out. You can actually, if you want more, you can separate them. Uh, so this was used for soap. Its edible root was roasted and it was used for fish poison, brushes, and glue. Let's talk about that for a minute. This is the uh, interior of the bulb. So the bulb is covered with fibers that are incredibly strong. Try to pull them apart, almost impossible. So these fibers were used for brushes by indigenous peoples. And if you bake the root, um, whether it's on hot rocks or in your oven, uh, a gum-like substance can be used to glue the baked roots can be used as a food source, particularly emergency food supply, and could be stored uh, once roasted, uh, providing food when other food was not available. The genus uh, Chlorogalum um, pomeridianum, I don't know if I spelled the Chlorogalum, can't even say it right, but it means a green liquid that blooms in the afternoon. So I don't have pictures, but small giant stalks of small lily flowers that will bloom in the afternoon. Um, a mole is um, one of the names of Spanish uh, and that has to do with cook cooking it. So 
If you peel the leaves, like peeling an onion more or less, then you can soap up with soap glue. I am demonstrating this here in my kitchen sink. Uh, perhaps not as easy as ivory soap, but uh, definitely a way to get your hands clean and definitely a really fun way to use the plant. Uh, when we do children's tours, uh, the, when the doses do children's tours at the Tilden uh, Regional Botanic Garden, this is one of the plants we use because it has so many uses and you can demonstrate in a graphic way how a native plant can be used for practical purposes. Another important plant is uh, the coast live oak. And um, the, the coast live oak, you can see starting on the right, the leaves uh, leafing out in the spring, uh, the leaves beginning to mature with the form they'll, you'll see it, them in it for most of the summer. And you can see that the tips and the kind of, um, they're, they're sort of shiny and tough leathery kinds of leaves. Here's the acorns uh, with the acorn cap and without the acorn cap. And here's the fallen leaves in the fall, uh, one which has turned brown and one which hasn't. And one of the ways to identify the coast live oak is the leaves are concave. So you could you actually put a little bit of water in there and, and you could hold it. Um, the coast live oak was, and other oaks were the major source of two thirds of the tribes of indigenous. oak, acorns, and the meal partially ground and all the way. You've got to, you've got to leach it by uh, boiling it or uh, soaking it in a stream in a, in a basket, which would perhaps be done by indigenous people, a basket made of uh, um, willow branches or uh, the roots of ferns uh, and soaked in water and then uh, roasted and, and ground. Here's another tree that's interesting. Uh, this is a willow. Here's the pussy willow uh, coming out in the spring. And this, the bark is a source of salicylic acid uh, when processed and uh, organic aspirin is in willow and poplar tree bark. And the, this is found, uh, the ancient Sumerians and Egyptians, as well as Hippocrates, Celsius, Pliny the Elder again, Dioscorides and Galen used these natural products as remedies for pain, fever and inflammation. And believe it or not, the National Institute of Health is one of the sources where I got, you know, some of the links and information. So it's. This is one that's like many of the plants like yarrow and mugwort, which has legitimate medical uses that have, have evidence-based uh, proof. Um, here's my favorite, uh, one of my favorite uh, food sources, which is the hazelnut. You won't find very many of them, but it's the softest, in my opinion, leaf in the California flora. Very, very smooth and soft. This is the nut in its husk. Uh, when you peel the husk, inside will be the equivalent of a wild filbert nut. And here are the catkins or the, or the, fem, uh, the uh, male parts. And usually the teeny red flowers will bloom at different times uh, on, on the plant so that it doesn't pollinate itself. It will pollinate with others. Here's just a quick run through of some fruits and berries, the gooseberry. This looks a little intimidating to eat, but with a glove or with a strainer, uh, there's a semi-sweet and great for the garden. Like the uh, uh, you know, looking berries and fruit, uh, but be careful of the very gnarly thorns. Um, here's a wild currant currently in bloom in my garden, and this will produce uh, uh, kind of purplish uh, berries in the fall, which are not super delicious, but they're very edible and, and somewhat sweet and definitely a good survival food. Here's toyon or hollyberry or hollywood, and believe it or not, Hollywood, California was named after this plant. Uh, so uh, it's an interesting reference, uh, and you'll see this in many places, and the fruit was uh, somewhat useful edibly if prepared properly. Uh, here's wild strawberry, very common uh, in the East Bay. And uh, here's a monkey flower. You can see the flowers down below. Uh, here's some of the plants. Here's a, uh, I've got a, a mugwort band-aid, and here's, I don't think, I mean a, a monkey flower band-aid. I'm not sure this is monkey flower, but it, I, Pull this off the web. It's a nice example of how you can use it for a band-aid or a necklace or that sort of thing. Uh, monkey flowers are thought to have the face of a monkey. There's many different species of monkey flower with different colors. Th this orange version uh, 
is uh, one that you'll find more commonly in East Bay. So the exploration and knowledge of native plants, including the medicinal, nutritional, cultural, and spirit spiritual uses, can heighten our awareness about the need to preserve native species and our local green belts and hopefully slow the decimation of plant communities and species that may be crucial to human survival. We all need plants. To, we, for the air we breathe, we need plants. And being out in nature can both be an antidote for the quarantine, but also a way to connect with nature and to work towards preserving our green belts. And so here's some resources. Uh, these will be sent to you. Um, I think I'll, I may just keep some of these better resources uh, on the screen. And uh, if, if there are any questions, uh, I left some time for questions uh, now. Yeah, Alan, so I know we have one that came in earlier. Corey asked, does mugwort help keep mosquitoes away? I, I'm not positive. Um, bay leaf is a little bit better than that. I haven't heard that specific use, but again, with you can Google these things and get the answer to that. I don't have the answer specifically. Um, some of the plants like mugwort are very good for repelling various forms of insects. And even mugwort uh, for, it has been used uh, for like a vermifuge uh, for toxic internal kinds of uh, purification as well. But I don't have the specific answer. Okay. Um, and Joan just shared an interesting comment, which I wanted to share with everyone else in case somebody missed it, which was, that yarrow can also be used for fabric dye um, when, when trying to get yellow. So that's fun. And there's many fabric dyes. Um, the uh, Oregon grape or Mahonia, if you, in the inside of the bark has a yellow dye. Many plants have, have dyes uh, and uh, th those were used uh, for basketry. Um, other artistic kinds of uses are the stems of certain ferns. Uh, particularly uh, five finger fern and uh, maidenhair fern were used as uh, a cross weaving for, for certain basketry uh, uh, mixed with roots of different uh, other ferns or branches of things like willow, things like that. Okay, um, Leslie asked, can this presentation be made available? I would like to send it to family members who missed this and I will answer that one. Um, so we will be sending a follow-up email later today. So as long as you're registered for the event, you should receive that email. Um, hopefully it lands in your inbox. If not, it, you know, depending on what email service provider you have, you might want to check some other folders, uh, but expect that this afternoon. And that will include a link to this webinar, as well as a link to the resources that Alan has shared throughout the presentation. So um, yeah, that, that should work for you, hopefully. Okay, and there's also, I'm gonna do a similar presentation uh, on April 11th for the El Cerrito Trail Trek, which pertains to the open space area of 100 acres of beautiful oak woodland uh, in, just in the El Cerrito area. Uh, so that's another place to see a live presentation. Great, yeah. Um, okay, Betsy asked, can you give some gardening tips, for example, fertilizer, uh, watering during summer, starting from seed, et cetera? Uh, it, you know, it's really specific to each species, but there's incredible literature on this. Uh, there's, there's a book, um, I can't, I can't run and get it now, but there's, there's basically um, uh, incredible literature on this. It really, it depends, like certain seeds have to be stratified, stratified uh, but uh, some of the resources that I gave, the Native Here Nursery, the, um, the Tilden Botanic Garden, the Friends of the Regional Park Botanic Garden, and um, places like Annie's Annuals, and uh, you know, many places will have uh, specific gardening advice for specific plants, but it's, there's not one general kind of thing, because uh, many of the native plants li live in different environments. Any other questions from our attendees this morning? So uh, let me just mention also uh, iNaturalist. I had mentioned that earlier. That's something that's been, um, I know some people have uh, adopted pest plants or uh, my indulgence during the pandemic has been using iNaturalist, which allows you to 
take your smartphone out and identify plants on the spot. And there's Seek is also a simpler version of that. So if, if you're more interested, I recommend that. I recommend the educational programs at the Regional Parks, Botanic Garden, nativeplants.org, the UC Berkeley Garden. And there's some great marked trails that help you learn. Huckleberry Preserve, which is one of the East Bay Regional Park trails. Um, and uh, of course, the, the hikes through Greenbelt. Uh, and Bay Nature Magazine. These are all resources. Once you learn even a few plants, then you can start looking them up and increase your knowledge. Um, many of the state parks and national parks have also marked trails that, that help you learn to identify. Awesome. Yeah, great to have these resources. Uh, thank you for sharing those, Alan. Um, let's see, a, someone asked, is chamomile a natural plant? There is a wild form of chamomile that is not the one that you're gonna buy uh, you know, in the store or online. Uh, it, it has some of the same properties uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's a pineapple weed. Uh, you often see it actually in, growing in the trails later in the summer. Uh, it looks a little bit like chamomile. It's a kind of a wild form of chamomile, but it's not a native plant. So you, you won't tend to see the cultivated one, um, but it, look up you know, wild chamomile. I, I believe it's Matricaria is the, is the genus. Uh, Okay, uh, and this might be for you, Alan or Ken, uh, from Susan. Has anyone done a count on the newts mentioned at the beginning of the presentation? Um, has closing the road for 18 months made a significant change? I can speak to that a little bit. So basically, in the past, it's closed from November through the end of March. And during the rains, you'll, uh, I have a hiking group and we often go up South Park Drive, which is the road that's closed. And so when the rains, when it's raining, we sometimes hike in the rain, or when it's just rained, um, you will see, you will be asking the question, why did the new cross the street? Uh, and you will see them on the trails, you will see them other places. Um, we, for fun, we tend to count how many we see. So I think once someone saw 50 newts, but usually if you see one or two, it's, it's fortunate. But the, the road was closed for the rest, the whole year due to the pandemic to reduce the traffic and, um, so many people are flocking to the parks, they had to do something to kind of reduce the uh, overuse. Uh, so you will see newts on a rainy day, uh, and that is why the, the road is closed, but I can't give you an exact count. Many years ago, somebody actually with a, with a sense of humor made a little newt crosswalk, painted it across the, the road there with a newt crossing sign, which of course disappeared within a week, but yeah. Oh, that's too bad, cute idea. Uh, okay, Betsy asked or said, I guess, my iNaturalist doesn't seem to transmit when I'm out on the walk. Any any feedback on that, Alan? Say that one again. She said, my iNaturalist doesn't seem to transmit when she's out on a walk. Um, well, if you're outside of, of um, you know, cell coverage, um, it won't transmit. However, if you have the GPS turned on, you'll be able to identify your plants later because it, the GPS will work even without the cell coverage. Um, and I see another question in the chat box about other trails in San Mateo County to discover uh, native plants. And I would recommend a San Bruno Mountain State Park. Um, and it, it's incredible, there's a real diversity. That's where I found the fire ants. <laughs> Be careful that they're there in a couple of places, but there's an incredible diversity of plants there. There's some amazing views from the top where you're looking at the skyline of San Francisco from the south, which is a, a place where you don't usually see the view. And, and it's a gorgeous trail, a San Bruno mountain. There's some rare lilies that are there, the chocolate lily. And we've done a, a Greenbelt Alliance outing there in the past, and we'll do some more once everything opens up again. Okay, um, back to the newts. Uh, Chris asked, when do newts eggs hatch? I discovered many newts and eggs in the pond on the Tilden Botanical Garden a few weeks ago. That, I mean, Ken, do you, do you know, I, I don't have the answer to that, but I love the, the Jewel Lake, the pond. Uh, the, the thing that you will discover at the pond are occasionally river otters will come into Jewel Lake and there's amazing reflections there. And it's a great trail for anybody, including people who can't walk well or kids, because there's a, there's a, um, raised trail there. Uh, but you see frogs, turtles, and uh, 
otters at times. Uh, I don't know when it's hatched. Ken, do you know? You know, it depends when the, the, the eggs are laid. I think it's from anywhere from four to eight weeks after they've been laid. And of course that depends on when these things fill up with water, when the ponds fill up with water. I know this year over near B. Brioni's Park, none of, the, none of the new ponds have any water in them at all. So the females never bothered to head down there and you just see a few males that are hoping against hope that uh, a female will make it. But I think, I think it's like four to six weeks or maybe even longer if it's cold weather. You will sometimes find newts, not the hatching, but in, in salamanders under rocks or under you know, fallen trees, things like that. Um, do you know, can you say where the newts are going when they are kind of across the street doing their thing? Um, I think they're going to, to water, but I'm not sure. Yeah, usually, usually it's the place they were born and it's right. by sense of smell. Cool. And they can move incredible distances very slowly, but they get there. Yeah, okay. I mean, they, oh, they're actually very cool to see. And uh, the best time, if you really want to see the newts, is to go when it's raining lightly or just after a rain. And, and just walk, you can walk up South Park Drive or any of the trails that come off of South Park Drive that, that we looked at. And a funny Tilden uh, Park story is the Junior Nature Lodge behind the uh, visitor center. They built a pond there and couldn't figure out for years why there weren't any newts in there. And I think eventually they kidnapped a few newts and put them in there. And then, and then, it would, then after that was populated each year. And, and regarding the Tilden Botanic Garden, it's an incredible resource. Right now it's open only by appointment, but eventually will be reopened. You can call and make an appointment. It's an incredibly great way to learn about native plants. And often if you learn a few plants, you can go on a hike right nearby, which is where most of the trails we talked about today are, and find the very plants that you learned about. It sounds like Alan's offering to lead a, a, an outing for us. Okay. It will include the Tilden Botanical okay. Garden. Okay, you're on. All right. Uh, okay, just a few more questions left. Um, so we have a question here. It says, I don't think you mentioned feverfew. Is that a California native plant? That's a common name. I'm not sure the genus of that. So I, I can't really answer the question. Okay, fair enough. And then Elaine asks, do you ever see mushrooms at Tilden? And if so, what kind? There's many mushrooms in Tilden. Uh, mostly, since mushrooms aren't my specialty, I photograph them and rely on iNaturalist and get quick identification. So you, you can see amanitas. You can see a wide variety of other mushrooms. And even an interesting phenomenon um, is during the summer, when there's a lot of fog, the water gathers in the Monterey pine trees and other trees. And, and actually creates puddles in the summer, even when it hasn't been raining for two or three months. And you sometimes see mushrooms coming up in the summer in these wet areas where the condensation from the fog drips onto the trail. And Debbie Klein, one of our outings leaders is a, a mushroom enthusiast and she leads an outing. We combine with it to see the newts in actually in Brioni's Park. So you can look for that, for that next year. Great. Okay. Um, well, Alan, if you want to put up the last slide, I think we'll go ahead and wrap things up. Oh yeah. Uh, oh, sunset from Mount Tam to see from Sea View. It. There were a couple of other ones. Some links which will be sent to you, and uh, links about yarrow and ethnobotany, and support Greenbelt. Yes, exactly. Um, so yeah, just wanted to say, you know that again, if anybody missed it, we will be sending out an email later that will include a link to this webinar, as well as the resources that Alan shared throughout the presentation. Um, so look for that in your inbox. Uh, and then Ken mentioned earlier that we will be uh, hosting another virtual outing in just a few weeks in April um, in Las Trampas Regional Wilderness. So sign up for that one so we can sh continue to share some fun knowledge with you about the region's open spaces. Um, and you can find out more information about our outings on our website at greenbelt.org forward slash events. Uh, and that's it from us. Thank you to everyone who joined and for the great questions. We really appreciated it. Thanks to everyone and thanks to Greenbelt. Thank you.